welcome to episode four of Let's Get Airborne. My name is Brian Eminis, and I'm uh, in semi-lockdown in the uh, city of Valcom. And not far from here, my director of this production is uh, Chris Rothman. He's in Pretoria. It's uh, a hearty welcome to our show. And we hope and trust that you are going to enjoy as I get ready to chat to my very special friend and, of course, extraordinary guest this evening, none other than the very well-known Chris Breers. Well, Chris, uh, looking at those photographs, that must really bring back uh, quite a few good memories. Yeah, hello, Brian. Thank you, first of all, for uh, bringing me onto your show. Um, it is a real privilege. And yes, it brings back a lot of memories. So, Chris, for you and I, it started way back in 1984. You flew into Margate, the then famous Margate Air Show. You had a Cessna um, 210, you and Diola. And I, can't, I think the boys were, must have been in, in uh, carry cots. And, no, that uh, was before their time. <laughs> before their time. Gosh, that just shows you. And uh, you were working for a company at that stage called Pension um, Industries. That is correct, yes. So the reason yeah, you were there is... Yeah. We flew into the air show, um, and um, it, it's, it's, it's quite an amazing event for me uh, in my history because that's the event where you and me met, first of all. Uh, secondly, um, I was there with, with the Special Forces uh, flying the, the parachute team uh, for the air show. And, um, and it's also the air show where myself and Herman Potkide did our very first uh, air-to-air photography sortie, which was quite by accident. This guy walked up to me and said, will you fly me? And I said, I will, but who are you? And... Uh, Herman was still using a box brownie in those days. It was, his, it was also his very first aviation sortie. It was my very first camera sortie. Um, so quite, quite a memorable air show, 1984. Indeed, indeed. And of course, the Special Forces guys that you um, were dropping at that stage all went on. You, we talk of them as Special Forces now, but they were the real rough and tough wreckies. And uh, guys that, that became legends. I mean, there's a lot written about these guys. And you were, you and, and the late Ferdy Cats were very much part of, the, uh, of, of their little inner circle because they trusted you. And, of course, you were dropping, you know, doing their, their various paradrops that they required. You were the man. It was a good time, and they were all uh, very good friends, unfortunately. Um, there are very few left these days, um, you know, but very special people. And uh, it, it was an honor working with them. And then, of course, Ferdy Cuts, uh, myself and Ferdy were very close friends. So let's move on to Herman Potchita, an absolute iconic photographer, a legend, an absolute legend. And the interesting part is you flew him around in a chieftain. If we look at the degree of difficulty, firstly, Herman moved up from a um, brownie box camera to uh, an SLR, and um, he had his cameras. He was phenomenal in the way that he went about, and the the, the rapport between you and Herman was incredible. Yeah, as I said, we met at that air show, and after that, he contacted me, and we started flying together regularly, and we both learned. I think uh, part of the success was that um, we both grew in, in that together. You need to realize or remember rather in those days, there were no digital cameras and it was all on film. And we always had these various cool boxes that had to be kept at certain temperatures with this different types of film that it was using. And, um, you know, we could only see the actual results of the photo shoot the next day after it's been to the studios and been developed we could see um, whether the whole shoot was a success or not. Um, so, and it was also very expensive to do all this development. So um, every shot counted. You couldn't take a thousand shot 
uh, shots and, and work on a, a 1% hit rate. Every shot had to count. And I think um, Herman, uh, you, you knew, knew him well, uh, he was probably one of the best photographers ever because he had an eye for the, for, for the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, he, was, he, was, he was world class, absolute yeah. world class. Chris, flying that chieftain, you're up in the sky and you've got people like Johan Fenter coming close with an F1CZ, but really close. There was incredible trust between those Mirage pilots, those fighter pilots, and yourself, because all the people see are the Herman Potgieter photographs that are in all these books and in air reports and saying, wow, you know, wonder where he was sitting or where was the camera when they took this photo? Bear in mind, no GoPros. It was all by hand on an SLR. Yeah. No, incredible. And, yes, it, it all boiled down to trust, um, especially flying with, with the fast movers. The reason, just by the way, that we used the Chieftain, uh, it was the only aircraft at the time that we could remove a door and normal v and &E, in other words, normal uh, never exceed speed, still applied. All other aircraft, um, if we removed a door, we had a speed restriction. And of course, wanting to fly with Mirage threes and F1s, and I mean, I even had uh, a sortie with the Sukhoi in, in, in the Hoodspray. Um, I had to fly uh, never, never below 200 knots. So we were going like hell in the Chieftain, and we were restricted on fuel, and we had to find the, the, the jets very quickly because at low altitude, they burnt a lot of fuel. So we didn't have lots of time for these sorties. And, of course, uh, with the making of the book, More Than Game, uh, there was some really, really interesting flying done there and uh, live bombs being dropped, and it was fun. It was really great. Apart from, you know, the fast movers and the mud movers and the nicknames that we've given the aircraft, you also took airliners. I mean, you were flying alongside Boeing 747s. In fact, where the client wanted a special photo, it was you and Herman that had to do the job. In the in the in those days, yes, it was very much like that. Um, and it, again, on, especially on the airliners, it was trust. You know, uh, with the inauguration um, in 1994, when Scully flew with the three seven four sevens, I flew formation on them. And you know, when they in formation with those big airplanes, there's no room for maneuver. Uh, maneuvering for them and uh, they had to absolutely trust that I will be you know remain out of their way etc and it was a big challenge keeping up with them I had to actually wait for them and time that when we went over the union buildings for that short period of time we were together and after that they pulled away from me again uh, because but of course you, you had to get special clearance I mean you had to get huge clearance because the world leaders were there, and the Air Force and the government had a very big clamp down. I mean, they had probably missiles and aircraft on standby. You come anywhere near those union buildings with all the world leaders, they take you out, you wouldn't even know that you existed. And yes, That's this right. chieftain whiz, whizzing over. <laughs> it was good fun. It was really great fun. Great fun. Okay, so we, we move off the Herman Potgita, um uh, fun that we had taking photographs there. And we go on to the establishment of your company, NatureLink, which was a very big company. You employed a lot of people and you had aircraft, you know, all over. What, what was NatureLink about, briefly? Um, NatureLink started out, um, and the name implies it, we uh, started out flying as a charter company doing air tours of Southern Africa. Um, grew bigger in charters. The, the air tour side didn't kick off the way we wanted it to and uh, eventually became involved in contract flying. Started flying for uh, the oil and gas industry off the west coast of Africa. And um, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of stories I can tell you those beginning days, guys like Mark Bookie involved and again, Freddie Katz, etc. And then uh, we got contacted by uh, AirServe International. Obviously, we did a lot of lobbying. And AirServe International, American company, part of the United Nations group. Um, and then we really started getting big in the, in the uh, contract flying. 
And um, I think part of it is because uh, the South Africans were trusted in those days. Um, we were prepared to go where a lot of the other countries weren't, weren't prepared to go. Um, and so it was that we ended up flying in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, uh, and just about the whole of Africa, the nice places like Somalia, Chad's. <laughs> um, and, you, know, um, you know how to pick them, eh? You know how to pick them. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, it was on, um, on Boxing Day, disaster struck. There was this huge tsunami tsunami that um, had the world once again in, in, in uh, upheaval, everybody just not knowing what to do. You, of course, kept calm. You got the um, illusion, the IL-76. You put your helicopters in there, uh, tents, radios. You picked the best pilots you could find. And off you went. And uh, you and your band of merry, merry men went in and did incredible work, rescue work, uh, as the South African team working, you know, in uh, in the heart of the tsunami. That's correct, Brian. It was uh, Boxing Day, um, um, the 26th of, of uh, December, when the phone rang and uh, uh, it was uh, the chief of uh, Asia of International in those days. And he said to me, have you got your television on? And of course I didn't, I think I still had a hangover because it's the day after Christmas. And um, yeah, we got tasked immediately. The South African government got involved and it was an amazing experience. We uh, ended up sending eventually two Illusion 76s. We uh, had five helicopters there and uh, it, was, it was a pretty grim operation, I must tell you. We were the first civilian team in Bandache, which is the, on the northern tip of uh, Sumatra. And um, quite a, a lot of adventure stories, but we ended up being based on a military base uh, on a small island just north of uh, Banda Aceh because the living conditions in Banda Aceh itself was, was just uh, not good. And um, of course, you know, it always sounds good, but I had an amazing team working with me. Um, I remember before we departed, Diola had a a truck with deep freezers on the back and she was going from, from uh, supermarket to supermarket and buying up steaks and burrows and whatever because our brief was we had to be 90 days 100% self-sufficient, including water. The only thing we would be supplied with was, uh, was fuel. Um, so those illusions were carrying vehicles, uh, water purification plants, air conditioners, generators, tents, the whole lot. And of course, one ton castle beer, for which I got very big into trouble um, landing um, in Manhattan because no alcohol allowed. Um, <laughs> the way things happen. <laughs> Chris, so there you'd already started to make a big name for yourself in the world of search and rescue, of which you went on to do lots of um, search and rescue, some of them that made headlines. Uh, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of search and rescue. If I look at and I think back of the air shows that you and I have done together while you were at NatureLink, over 400 air shows. And in that time, you have, if it's got wings or rotor blades, you've displayed it. I've been very fortunate, Brian. To have been uh, to have been able to do all of these things, um, and uh, you know, I, in the aviation world, I had some of the best tutors, um, the top guys. I, uh, I got taught aerobatics by guys like Glenn Dell and, and Scully, and Ellis Levine spent time with me. Um, so, and of course, all of those guys are my friends, Nigel, etc. And um, it, it's just a real big privilege to have been able to have done all of this um, in my career, um, you know, because all of the air shows and the air races and, and that was, that was not part of work. That was, that was for fun and for building aviation and for having a passion for aviation. And, and building aviation, it was indeed, you became, and I don't know if that record's been broken, but I know that, at one stage, and I think it's still like that, you've been the only South African ever to fly a full display at Oshkosh. 
And for those of our friends that are watching that don't know where Oshkosh is or what Oshkosh is, on a good day, I think they get around 19,000 aeroplanes. That is like the biggest pilgrimage in the world for aviation. Flying the Pac-750, that must have just been unreal. It was an amazing experience. I mean, Oshkosh in itself is just, you can't describe it to anybody. You have to go. And at that time, I was the uh, display pilot for Pacific Aerospace uh, in New Zealand. Um, I was the international display pilot, and that's, that's how I ended up at Oshkosh, um, and that's how I got a slot. And uh, lots of, uh, there's several South Africans that have flown at Oshkosh, but I think I'm the only one that's done an official, official air show display um, at Oshkosh for the five days that we were there. Full on display every day. The, your, your air show uh, um, resume is incredible. Before I go on to that, because we are going to chat about that, some of the fun things that, if I think back of NatureLink, you know, I've been very lucky because we're such big mates. Every big job that's come along from your side, the telephone would ring and you'd say, this is the idea I've got, or this is what I'm going to do. Get up here and uh, put put words to it, put a voice to to what I'm doing. And if I think back of the legacy launch in your hangar, that, that, that was just incredible. I mean, it, it was... We had a world-class launch that the legacy guys kind of looked and, and wondered, you know, is this Africa? Yeah, we were very proud of that, that moment. It's, of course, the Embraer Legacy, which is the uh, executive jet that, uh, the, the first executive jet that Embraer uh, produced. And um, we were the African uh, agents for it. And, uh, yeah, there's also stories behind the story there, Brian, because uh, we had that incredible launch and we were to fly to Cape Town the next morning um, to do the Cape Town launch. And as you remember, um, a, a doctor, which was an eye specialist, taxied his 402C under the wing of the Legacy and hit the, uh, the winglet and the uh, aileron uh, with his left propeller. So that put an end to that show and got us all into big trouble, uh, including the factory guys, because they didn't have a demonstrator for me to use for the launch. So that aircraft was actually on its way to a new client in Russia. So uh, it was supposed to leave us in Cape Town on the Monday and be to be delivered to the new owner in Russia. And of course, the airplane never got to Russia and he didn't want a damaged airplane. So the factory had to build him another one. And the eye specialist said, I never saw the plane. I will not repeat that conversation. <laughs> so, Chris, that hangar, we also had good times. We're talking about hard work now because your, your, your events are high profile. They're not easy to do. One's got to really concentrate, but it's a lot of fun. If we look at fun, I remember one Christmas you decided that we are going to have the Christmas party in the hangar and we are going to make it Mauritian style on the beach. You brought in, I don't know, you'll give me the figures. You brought in tons of sand. You built a sea, a very big, I mean, it was so deep that guys had masks and snorkels, the amount of water. And then when I announced dessert, I was kind of, the whole evening was, you had that cocktail bar and oh, it was incredible. But the, the cherry on top for me was when I said to the guests, and I went, there must have been about 500 good people there. And I said, folks, we're now having dessert. Three ice cream vans, three Volkswagen ice cream, cream vans were there. Little ding-dong tunes came riding through the crowd and everybody was served whatever ice cream. That I have never seen. I don't think anywhere in the world. That was very special. Those were good times. Those were good times. And um, um, it, it was a good company. I had a really good team working, uh, working with me. And... Um, we actually had four, uh, four year-end functions like that, each with a different theme. But the beach party one, I think, will also be, always be the most memorable because it was the first one. Um, if I recall, we brought in 80 tons of sand and so the, the, the pool took something like 70,000 liters or something crazy. Yeah. And, uh, we and had my, my, brief, my brief was wear your costume. And <laughs> I kind of thought, hey, to a, to a, a year-end function, yeah costume if we move now on to the exciting races you 
you were involved with the, the uh, PTAR, the President's Trophy Air Race in South Africa. You had organized a few of them. In fact, you won one of them. So you not only raced in the PTAR, but you also organized them. And then you started, started kind of getting disillusioned and you wanted something of your own. And uh, you spoke to Eddie Foster, the guys in Zanin, and came up with a race. Eddie still phoned me and said, what are we going to call this thing? And I jokingly said, why don't we call it the Race of Champions? Because everybody that takes part in an event like this is a champion. You like the idea. And so the Race of Champions was born. Right, Nathan, that's correct. I flew uh, 18 races with the, with the President's Trophy. Uh, great times, and it wasn't so much that I wanted a race of my own. Um, there was lots of uh, unhappiness because of, of the way the handicapping was done. And essentially, the only difference, as you remember, between the race of champions and the President's Trophy race is the way that we handicapped the, the aircraft. Um, very simple recipe, and people understood where the handicap came from, and they were happy. And uh, then, as you know, we changed the format a little bit with the camping that we brought in, um, where people weren't dispersed into hotels and you only saw them once or twice during the weekend. Um, yes, but unfortunately, that it, it was very successful, as you would probably know where it all ended up. But uh, it didn't make me a lot of friends uh, in Safa. Yeah. <laughs> you, you became branded as the, the renegade. But that didn't get you down. Four race of champions in South Africa. And then you moved away, uh, not only from NatureLink, you joined NAC and you opened up the hangar at Bonneboom, incredible uh, launch that we had there. Your time at, at NAC wasn't very long because you wanted, and, you, and those who know you, you're the guy who wants your own company and you have your ideas, and you decided to open up Air Team. And, of course, Air Team became the next best thing since sliced bread. Very, very big, huge hangars at Bonneboom, lots of aeroplanes. And, I mean, that saw you taking part in more air shows. It saw you move towards Botswana. Botswana were now fledgling in the world of the Matsieng. Uh, air show, those incredible guys in Botswana, and I know they're all watching this evening because that's where you are at the moment in uh, Botswana. And Matsieng Air Show was the seed that was planted, and, and of course, you got involved. And let's talk a little bit about Matsieng, and then we'll move on to the iconic uh, race for rhinos. Now, Brian, you're correct. We um... I sold uh, NatureLink to uh, the Imperial Holdings Group, and of course, um, NAC is part of that group, and that's how, how I ended up with NAC. Um, and then we started Air Team, quite correct. Um, also, great team, great fun, very much the same format uh, or recipe as with, with NatureLink. Um, and yes, through, through mutual friends, got involved with the guys at Matsieng. As you say, incredible group of people. They're real enthusiasts. Um, they enjoy their flying. And um, they asked me to come and, and, and run their show for them um, as Airboss, which I've done over the years. That got me involved with, uh, with the international air show at Sir Seletsikama Airport. And we did two of those, which were very successful. And that um, again uh, put us on 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 the on the uh, map for the race for rhinos. Race for rhinos was actually uh, the brainchild of um, the guys from Matsieng, the flying club itself. They got us in in contact with the minister of tourism, um, and that's after you and me realised that we're not going to be allowed to have another um, race of champions in South Africa. So the race of champions became the race for rhinos, sponsored by, by Botswana Tourism Organization. And of course, the minister was very much on our side. 
And that opened doors for us to do things that, that nobody else has ever done before, which is, uh, which I, is a real problem. I don't think anywhere, anywhere in the world, not even a military operation, because we went to the Kubu Island, which is a, a world heritage site. A small, how big is that team from Matsieng? I would think if they 12 members, that's a lot. And, Actually, and those guys, 10. 10, there you are, 10 members. And those guys, under the leadership of Henty Devet, they moved in and built a city. And it truly was a city. I mean, you, there was nothing there. It's a pan. Abolition blocks, over, what, 500 tents. There was messing facilities. There was absolutely everything. Mobile hospital. But best of all, I was put in charge of the Kubu Island Broadcasting Corporation because it was an independent state. And right next to me, where I was broadcasting, just happened to be the president at the time of Botswana. And this was like so bizarre because, yeah, I'm broadcasting and the president strolls over and says, you know, come and have a cup of tea. And I thought, but we're the bodyguards. We're the snipers and the 40 black cars with blue lights. Incredible. And I mean, that was Kubu. We did two at Kubu Island. And, and then it rained. So we couldn't use, we couldn't land on the island. Sorry, we couldn't land on the pans anymore. So we That's undertook that, that recce and we went up to Sewer Pan. That's correct. Yep. And Sewer Pan was just incredible. I mean... You know, if, if we look at Sewer Pan, when you and I were there, we flew up with the King Air for the Reiki. We just stood and, and gazed there because there was a lot of water. So we yeah. really did have a pan full of water. And you converted the whole place into a city. It was a pure city. We had roads. We had street lights. We had that huge Scania generator. We had everything, absolutely. And then when the airport opened, 120 aircraft racing, if I'm right. Yeah, the, the last race, the fourth race, we uh, we actually went for the Guinness Book of Records. And uh, I think officially it is the biggest air race in the history of the world. Um, we had 120 aircraft started, and I think 114 uh, completed the race. Um, and that record stands. So, And we did that in the middle of nowhere. In the absolutely the middle of nowhere, but apart from that, you had aerial, you had aerial displays, you had about eight or nine helicopters there, including a uh, Augusta uh, one one nine. So it was a lot of it wasn't just Robinson; it was full house four oh sevens, jet rangers. They were all there. Yeah, that was so much fun because uh, what happened was. A guy called me and asked, can, can he race with his helicopter? And I said, no, it's not. It's a fixed wing race. He said, but I, I got to go and I can only fly a helicopter. And I said, well, well why don't you come help us? Because uh, of the remoteness, it's always difficult getting teams to the turning points, etc. cetera. So why don't you become part of the team and come fly for us uh, as, as a support team? He spoke to a bunch of mates and then eventually the whole world was full of helicopters. And that race, we... We only used helicopters to move uh, marshals around, which was great. And of course, and search, search and rescue. That's of course that. Um, my job is uh, because I can't fly in the race because I'm the organizer. Once the airplanes start flying, I have my little bit of fun. Um, I'm then um, the the rescue one, and as you rightly said, I used the Augusta 119 for that. The the last two years before that, I had a squirrel. Um, but we had a very safe race, uh, all four of the races so far. In fact, all eight our our races, uh, we've had no serious incidents. And uh, the ones that were there, we could fly out again. And remember the one where he ended up in the river and we flew it out the same day. Um, and yeah, and then my fun is to fly the television cameras with, with the Augusta 119, which is a great machine to fly as well. So the race of rhinos has definitely made its mark and I've had numerous uh, messages, please ask Chris, do you think there will be another race for rhinos? Difficult one. Uh, the decision was taken by the by the Matsieng Flying Club that uh, 2021 there will be an air race. How big and what format, especially with what's going on in the world right now, very difficult to say, but 
we're going to have a race. Maybe it might be smaller. Um, it might not be at the pans, um, but we're going to have a race. Chris, we've spoken a lot about, you know, what you've done uh, with the various companies. And I know that aviation safety is something that's very close to your heart. And in Botswana, you brought in the American system of the Airbus. And the Airbus has proved in, in Botswana and also in Mozambique um, and Swaziland to be an incredible system of running an air show where you've got one person in charge and that person runs the whole show. But in South Africa, that was not accepted very likely. In fact, uh, I think you probably made a few enemies uh, when, when you brought it up. Brian, yes, I think uh, the big problem came with the two adrenaline shows that we did. Very big shows, very varied acts where we were combining a, a bunch of uh, other acts, which was not aviation. And uh, having flown a lot in the, in the United States, um, I was always impressed by the Airbus system because it works. It's a situational awareness. And of course, the Airbus must have people backing them up. Um, so you'll have your safety guy and you'll have other controllers keeping the airspace around clean and whatever is in the box is for the airbox. Um, and as politics go, that didn't go too well. But fortunately in Botswana, um, I was allowed to, to follow that line. We, uh, we learned a lot from the Americans. And I think if you look at the, at the record, we've had incredible air shows here. Um, and air races, and they've all been safe. We don't break the rules. Um, I don't think, uh, in fact, I, I don't think we have to stand back for any safety uh, standard anywhere in the world with the shows that we run. And you've been you've been in, involved with with every one of them. Um, so yeah, it is sad that that that, that things uh, went that way. But it's I'm also quite happy where I am, and I'm I'm quite proud of my record. Um, it speaks for itself as far as safety goes. Indeed, to be able to organise, you know, the, the, the shows, the adrenaline shows were not air shows. Those were super shows. The presidential shows in um, uh, Gaborone, they are super shows. These are big shows. I mean, these are shows when you start using the main airport. But if we quickly go back to Matsieng, it's just because I just love that place. It is probably the only uh, air show venue in Africa. And when I say air show venue, it's got everything. It has a tower. It has its runways. The fences are there. It's a case of you arrive, something that, that reminds me of Nampu, that the farmers have got. You know, once a year, they for three days or four days, uh, people come and they look at tractors and do their whole thing. It's the same there. People come and camp and they just enjoy one huge festival of fun. That's right, Brian. I think that's unique and I think that is that is part of the success is that people can fly in. It's a very popular fly-in uh, uh, air show. Um, the government must take a lot of... Uh, credit as well. You know, when we have these air shows, they move and open up that airport as a customs and immigration sport for overboard in flight. I mean, imagine when in the world you can organize things like that. Even with the air races, um, people could fly straight from outside the country, land in the pan, and have your passport stamped there and customs will be around. Um, and then, of course, the Matsying team, I think, makes it that much more, more uh, special. The whole family, all the families are involved. Um, everybody works hard, everybody plays hard, everybody's got the friends that flies in. And then, of course, we've got the crowd. And the, the Botswana people loves the air show. They love Maybe aviation. They, yeah. They, they, they absolutely love it. I mean, I have had the honor now of presenting all the shows for you, and I use, uh, they, I have people that speak their language, so we translate and we hype the crowd up. And uh, it's just incredible. But I think also the past president, Sir, Sir Ian Karma, who is watching at the moment, Sir Ian Karma has played one huge role because he's an aviator. He has a love for aviation. He's got a passion for his people. And he saw 
while he was president the benefit of bringing all these South Africans across. He's clever because everybody was spending money. And of course, it was an ideal marketing tool for his beautiful country. That's right, Brian. Um, it is, uh, it's always been an honor to work um, under the president, uh, President Karma, the former president. Um, great man. And um, you haven't met our new boss yet. Uh, president Masisi is also a great guy. It's a pity we didn't have the air show this year, otherwise you would have met him as well. But it goes, it goes for all of the, the people here. They, they like working with you. You've got access to the government. You can talk to people. Um, it's not that the government here is, is removed from the people and you cannot reach them, um, which I think is part of the, the success of Botswana. So talking of success, we know how successful and what a beautiful country Botswana is. You, during your time uh, at NatureLink, I'm going to go back to NatureLink, but I'm going to go on the special projects because your engineering brain, working with very clever people, you've designed a lot of things. One of the things that comes to mind is, of course, camps, the uh, civilian, um, the, the missile protection system. You'll give me the acronym. Uh, I know that that was very special. We all went down to Bredarsdorp, to Overberg, and you tested it. And it was, that was, I'd like to go through, you know, the, the, the engineering side of what you have built and, uh, you know, what's now around the world, thanks to you. Brian, you actually said it, uh, it's thanks to working with some very clever people. Now, it's one thing to have uh, big ideas. It's another thing to put them into practice. Uh, the United Nations was looking for a, a missile protection system, and uh, we approached uh, the Swedish company, Saab, and in conjunction with Saab, they obviously developed the, the system itself, we, the electronics, um, and we did the integration into the aircraft. We used the Embraer 120 as a test bed, and it turned out to be very, very successful. Uh, the difference with the system, you'll see some photographs now of flares being shot out, but the system actually does not work with flares. The flares is an older system. It's called a pyrotechnic. What makes CAMP so special is that it works with a pyrophoric, which is actually a chemical heat that is uh, a disc that is shot out of the aircraft. Uh, it creates a cloud of chemical heat, no flame, and that's what, what takes the eye of the missile of the aircraft. Uh, the reason why that was done is that with pyrotechnic flares, can you imagine you parked at a busy airport and that thing starts shooting off, you'll burn down half the city. Where with, with pyrophorics, the, you needed 120 knots for this thing to activate and then should it fall out on the tarmac, you'll just pick it up and put it back in the magazine again. Um, incredible program. We spent a month doing the test flying and that's proper test pilot, test school, test flying, because we had to tick all the boxes for, for the whole world, not just for the South African CAA. Um, that system was FAA approved as well. Yeah, we had, a, we had several good, uh, good projects. That one was really great. And what made that so special is when I know I was down there, you flew me in to, um, to come and put the voice to, to uh, camps. And... Uh, you got to ride in a cheetah. That must have been pretty awesome. And best of all, with Yanni Scott. Uh, that yeah, that's you. Right. Uh, it was right for a ride. I let Yanni fly the 120 and he let me fly the cheetah. Oh, <laughs> fly the 120, I'd say, come, you can drive my bucky. <laughs> so, Chris, if we look at you, you developed the Fleur for the, um, for the pack. You developed a pod that was fitted, I think, under the King Air. There were, there were numerous special projects that, that, you know, you were involved in? Now, to highlight a few, it was the uh, spray system on the Embraer 110, where uh, the aircraft was used for uh, offshore oil spills um, and it, to spray chemicals on oil spills. There was the, as you say, the King Air uh, with the pot that had a, a, a big capsule that was released under parachute, which was developed and used to free... Uh, hostages with the Somalian pirates. Um, another, we can do another three programs on, on stories behind the stories on that one. 
we did the FLIR system on the P750. That was that was a really great great project. And there was a lot of smaller smaller um, highlights. But you know, again, it was working with great people, people who had a passion for what they were doing, and um, come up with the idea, get a group together, start a planning session, and then build it. For you. Chris, as we uh, start wrapping up, something that I could but not notice, and it and it's something that that kind of irks me, and that is that you've given so much to aviation in South Africa, in Africa, but you've never been recognised. You know, nowhere have I ever sat at a at at a gala function and heard your name being called. And there are so many, there are so many. Uh, things that you've done that warrant this and that I've kind of find, you know, why is this guy being overlooked? I know you and I did grace the podium when my company organized the air land and sea uh, air show, that big one. And you were part of it. You helped me put it together. And of course we won the best air show in South Africa. And I then said, you know, Chris and, and the team, come up onto the stage with us when we receive this accolade. But you as a person, uh, I find that, you know, um, very concerning. Uh, Brian, uh, yeah, we're not going to go into the politics of the thing. I did receive uh, a couple of awards, but none, nothing official from the South African Power Flying Association or the Aero Club of South Africa. It was uh, with the Adrenaline Show, we, we won Air Show of the Year twice in a row. Uh, but that is an initiative which is not part of, 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 of the uh, Aero Club. Um, I'm actually not too concerned about it. It is sad. Uh, but you know what? I'm very proud of what we all achieved, and nobody can take it away from us. Well, that is absolutely correct, and nobody can take Those memories are there. There's no money that can buy. Uh, I must say a very, very big thank you to you uh, and that incredible team in um, – uh, Botswana, I know that your boys are in aviation, both of them. You must be very proud as Rikus and Darius are uh, watching us this evening uh, from uh, Australia where they are flying. Well, they're not flying at the moment. They're also in lockdown uh, flying for Qantas. So uh, it's nice to know that not only have you given back so much to the people, but also directly to your two boys who um, are aviators just like you. Brian, yes, that's, that's probably the biggest achievement of my, of my life. I'm very proud of my boys. They, um, and by the way, they are both still flying. Um, they're part of the 10% of the Qantas pilots that are still actively flying. So um, they're doing well on that side. Very proud of them. Very proud of my, uh, my grandchildren. Um, and then, of course, Diola. She's, uh, she's now with me for 34 years, so she must love me a little bit. <laughs> to put up with all your ideas and, uh, yeah, for sure. That takes, that takes some doing. Well, I must say a very big thank you to you this evening in Gaborone. That, of course, is episode four and our very special guest, Chris Breers. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. And, uh, yeah, you take care, and I look forward to seeing you at Matsieng and, of course, uh, to um, have fun on the race. I think it's going to be a, a really great one. Brian, thank you. And it's a big privilege. Thank you very much for being on the show, or allowing me on the show. So from me, Brian Eminence, with a very special thank you to Simon Kersian from Inconet, who provides us with all the data that we use, and then our uh, executive director, Chris Rothman, we wish you well. Thank you for all the uh, emails, for all the messages. We try and take note, and uh, we do try and follow a lot of the messages that we get. Well, from me, Brian Eminence, till I join you on Friday evening, where my special guest will be Major Chris Pretorius, the former South African Air Force Mirage F1AZ display pilot, he will be in the hot seat and he will be chatting to us all about what it was like flying the F1 on various air shows around South Africa. Look after yourself, stay safe, stay at home and cheerio. <laughs>